are taking God's word literally, setting our minds on things above and uh, not on things on the earth. So let's open with prayer and ask the Lord to be with us as we begin the second uh, set of four constellations and see what God has in store for us. Our gracious God, thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity to get together tonight. Pray that you would capture our hearts and our minds with your creation and draw us closer to you through it all. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to understand your great love for us and how you have preserved in the heavens a wonderful story. Help us to hear that story tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, so we have a key verse, and I kind of alluded to it earlier. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Where is it found? Colossians 3, 2. So that is something that uh, years ago there was a saying. People said, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And some of us have, have uh, maybe said that ourselves or we've been said about us at times. Um, however, years ago I found a verse in uh, the New Testament that says, uh, think on those things. And the idea of uh, there's, there's higher things to think about. And then this verse came along, set your mind on things above. Uh, not on the earth. And so it's a challenge to keep your mindset in the heavenlies. However, I have concluded over the years that people who have Jesus on their mind are more productive on earth than people who have earth on their mind <laughs> and only are consumed with themselves. So in the long run, I think ultimately we have to say, if I have to choose, I'm going to set my, thing, my mind on things above. I'm going to lift up my eyes above the hills and then find strength. So as we journey through this tonight, uh, we are going to close out. But before we do, consider this. Here's a supernova uh, remnant, uh, affectionately named N49. I don't know if that means anything to you. doesn't mean a thing to me. But what that little capture there by NASA and their cameras says is there's something bigger than us out there. Because I couldn't do that. And uh, the greatest artist in the world could probably computer something that. But God doesn't use computers. And so just hold on to that idea that this is, this is a God moment. This is what God did. Somebody captured it on their camera. And I would venture to say that that kind of stuff happens while we're trying to figure out how to tie our shoe. We're trying to figure out how to get the car fixed. We're trying to figure out how to get healed, uh, take care of puppies. Uh, you know, all this stuff's going on. So anyway, next picture shows us another a discovery. I like this little thing uh, Delana put on there. Stupefied astronomers have unveiled the first and only known galaxy without dark matter. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, hmm, did they just discover heaven? Because <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus is the light, and he's going to be there, and there's no night. And uh, so, I don't know. But uh, that's a pretty amazing thing picture right there and to think that uh, somehow it just happened versus the idea that there's a creator out there who's, who's still functioning. The next slide takes us to this verse. Let's read this out loud together. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And that's the whole, in my mind, this is why we're doing this. It's not so that we can become astrologers or astronomers or that we can gain some kind of incredible knowledge. It's so that we can be reminded that in all of creation, God purposed the stars, God purposed the earth. He put it all together with a plan. And he had mankind in mind. We've, made, we've been made a little lower than the angels. The reality of our humanity is both frustrating and encouraging. 
And when it comes to God's view, we need to remember that. Next slide shows us kind of how we view the heavens. You know, it's a great dot-to-dot -dot game, and that's kind of what we're going through as we go through these constellations. And right there, it looks like a lot of confusion, uh, to, especially to the majority of people who don't know what the heavens are consumed with. Hopefully, you're starting to see that, you know what, I think I, think I can see this. I think I can see that. Matter of fact, the other night I was out, um, and it, the sun had gone down, and it was clear skies, and I think I saw Scorpio. Yeah, I, I caught myself going, wait a minute, that looks familiar. So, so the more you, more you pay attention here, and, and, and then you go out, and when we go camping in the first week of September, and it's, it's dark out there, we're going to see some of this stuff. And I'm hoping that as we get more and more familiar with it, that when we do look up into the heavens, we can say, oh, look at that, and then we can tell the story that the stars have been telling for all these thousands of years. Next slide. This is the Maseroth, and it's that, uh, that uh, acrostic that has been put together uh, for the secular version names of those constellations. And this is really kind of sums it up, and I, I want to keep reminding us that this is why we're doing this, because the Virgin leads stars showing Christ and powerfully advances through great Christian living. That's, that's the whole goal of what we're endeavoring to do. Uh, and, and if we can capture what God has in store for us out of his creation, I think we will definitely be far, far ahead of, of others who just simply settle for what the world has said. Amen? Next. Now, I told you a couple weeks ago we were going to start to include the Hebrew names because Maseroth is Hebrew, and a lot of those other uh, constellation names are either Latin or Greek, and uh, they're connected with a whole different mindset uh, than the biblical mindset. So real quick, this is the, uh, the black list is the names of the, the Hebrew names of the uh, zodiac constellations, and that would fall into that idea of the Maseroth. So Bethula, Mosan name, Akarb, Kaseth, Gedi, which will be on tonight, Delhi, Dagam, Tala, Re'em, Tam'em, Nava, and Arya. Now, are you confused yet? <laughs> Does it make any more sense? No. It's not Greek to you, though. It's Hebrew, okay? <laughs> and uh, those names, those names again, you know, I don't want us to get so caught up in, oh, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this. Uh, um, but I just want you to realize that before the Greeks and before some of these other secular in, inclusions or inventions or uh, insert, inserting their, their myths and mythologies, uh, there was a biblical name for all of these things. And there was a, a name that I would venture to say came from the very mouth of God. Think about that. Isaiah says God names them. Psalm says God names the stars. And if he shares secrets with John the Revelator, if he shares secrets with Isaiah and Jeremiah and the prophets of the Old Testament, I would venture to say that somebody along the line said, we're going to name that constellation right there this. And like, where'd you get that from? I was talking to God last night, and he showed me that. And if God, I thought about this, because really some of these constellations don't make sense unless you know the names of the st stars. And as I began to think about that, I thought, you know, people have questioned whether the Bible is legitimate. You know, can God, can, can it really be still accurate, even though it's been through all these translations and all these human factors? I have a feeling God can keep his word uh, regardless of how many secular influences are out there and so so i want you to hold on with that mindset that god can keep his word true god can keep those names 
And even if we start changing them to numbers, if we start changing them to secular things, somewhere along the line, God's going to keep his. And that's what we're discovering. I hope you, you are joining me in discovering these wonderful truths that have been around for thousands of years, and now we can just enjoy discovery and go forward. So that particular slide, uh, you'll see over and over, and um, I've given you now five weeks with no handouts but don't get used to that because i know that in order for you to really grasp this you need to see it hear it write it speak it so we may be practicing some some bathula are you ready <laughs> kind of stuff <laughs> we'll see if we can do it anyway but i would encourage you let's 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 prepare our hearts to receive what God has for us, and we will be speaking a new language, and it might be, might be, might be beneficial. You know, you never know when you're going to run into somebody who speaks Hebrew, and uh, you're going to be able to say, hey, what's this word? And no. All right, next slide. So let's do a quick review. Virgo was the first one. Bethula is the Hebrew name. And the three deacons, uh, the Virgo is the virgin, coma, the desired son, Buetes, the coming, Centaurus, the dual natured. This is all prophetic, talking about the one who is going to come, the seed of the woman, the desired one, that the, the comes with a sickle, harvest, comes with a shepherd's rod as a shepherd, and we know that speaks of Jesus. But the greatest revelation I see out of this is the fact that the one who's coming is Emmanuel. God with us. The next constellation, Libra, uh, was the required price, and uh, the surrounding deacons were the cross, endured, crux, lupus, the victim slain, corona, the crown bestowed, and all of those are, again, prophetic. They're talking about how the balance was going to be paid through the cross, and that ultimately the victory would go to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He would be crowned with many crowns. The next constellation is the constellation Scorpio. And it would be in this one that the sting of death was to be crushed. We see the heel of, uh, of the uh, man. Um, excuse me. Yes, the heel of the man is crushing the Scorpio which is a symbolism of Satan and his, his kingdom. The uh, sting of the scorpion is pressing towards the heel, and uh, that is a fulfillment of Scripture. And then the serpent is restrained, and ultimately Hercules, which is a, a, a type of Jesus in the, in the idea that he is conquering the dragon and uh, defeating it. Uh, sets the stage for understanding that the desired one, the seed of the woman, the branch, would ultimately balance the scales. How? By bringing death to the kingdom of darkness and finding victory. Restraining the, the serpent and also finding victory with, uh, with the... Well, you notice there at the top, it's got a club. It's the one, the man that's upside down, Hercules. It's got a club, and and I, I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize <laughs> that he comes. Jesus said, I, "I, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to set some things against each other." And there's some conflict in that whole dynamic. But the reality of our of our promised Messiah is that he is the Prince of Peace who came to set some things in order. He cleaned the temple twice. Uh, he put the things back into order that were out of order. And uh, we see this in the constellations when, when we see, come across these things. The next constellation, which was the last one we covered last week, Sagittarius and company. It was the archer coming in victory. Uh, it is the uh, praise of the, of the Lyra. And uh, the hawk that uh, carries the praise upward, his eye, the enemies uh, are in fire on the altar. And uh, a picture of the eternal fire where they will fall to. His enemy are revealed and thrown down in the dragon Draco. Uh, this is the 
fourth constellation. It closes the first book of uh, the constellations. Chapter 1 is the promise. Chapter 2 is the, the purpose. Chapter 3 is the, the exposing of the enemy. Uh, the scorpion, the snake, and the dragon. And then this chapter 4 is the, the victor coming and uh, the defeat of the praise of the victory as well as the defeat of the dragon. So that leads us to our next constellation, which is, in most circles, you would know it as... Say it again? Capricorn. Capricorn. Now... Though everything that I have found has either said Capricorn or Capricornus. So I'm not sure where the us fits in there, and I'm not a linguist, but, but I just know that most people say Capricorn. Um, so if you see Capricornus, that's because that's what, that's what, was, uh, what was discovered. Um, interestingly enough, you, you'll notice that uh, the, the pictures or the renditions of that uh, show a, a, not a dominant pose, but a defeated pose. The, the, uh, the head is, is not rose up like on the archer. If you remember that last shot we had there, the, the horse was raised up in an, in an advancing, the arrow was pulled. Uh, you'll notice in this particular one, the goat is humbled. And uh, if you notice the, the feet, notice the right foot is underneath. The idea that it may be trying to get up, but it can't get up. It got froze in that position, and that'll play into some things a little bit later. The ancient names of this, next slide, please. Oh, let me, see, let me show you this. This right here, if you, if, you, if you hadn't seen those first pictures, you'd probably be saying, yeah, I don't think there's a goat in there. And where's the tail of a fish? And this is, this is uh, Capricorn is the, the goat fish. It's, uh, so uh, initially when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is dual natured. But the more I got to study and the more I got to learn about the, the stars and names, it's not necessarily meant to be a dual nature as much as it is the death that brings life. You'll see that in just, just a minute. But these are, these are where the stars are. And uh, if you look at that very top one, Jedi, that's where they got Star Wars from. Just kidding. <laughs> but it wouldn't surprise me if somebody who was doing Star Wars knew some of these things and they start using these different names, whether it's Star Trek or Star Wars or or whatever movies that they've done with space. I venture to say somebody knows some of these old names. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into those definitions. Um, just, just know that out of all of that dot to dot, something has to say goat. Something has to say fish or something along that line because... I'm seeing a mask, not a goat. <laughs> I'm seeing, and we could, we could sit here and, and, and walk around that. But, but bottom line is, when God put it together, he put a name on it. And he shared that name with somebody. And it's been passed down thousands of years now to be what we now know as Capricornus or Getty. Next slide. So Getty is the Hebrew name of Capricornus. The other ancient names are just a little more understanding. The Capricorn is Latin, and it actually means goat. So they got half of it right. Okay, so the Latin's got 50% of it right. Uh, the Hebrew Getty is the kid or the goat. It also means the cut off. And this idea of being cut off has, has significance with the atonement. Uh, and we're going to see this in a little bit uh, as we walk through some things. The, the goat laying down, not standing, uh, implies the idea that there is a, a death. Now, anybody familiar with the Old Testament enough to remember where goats were involved? Where? Good. They were, there was a sacrificial goat. 
Now, in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 3, God says, To the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a kid of the goats as a sin offering. So, capture that if you will. Remember, the first four constellations have all been about how the, the promised seed of the woman was going to balance things out, conquer death, hell, and the grave. The enemy would be defeated. How is he going to do it? To the cross. So, carrying that on as we close out the first book of the constellations now we get into something that's going to show us how it actually came about and interestingly enough it starts with the head of a goat down but the tail of a fish in leviticus chapter 16 Verse 5, it says, He shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. In verse 8, it carries on. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. So understanding that idea of a goat, some people put it with Satan as a goat, some people put it with other, other things. But I think if we can carry that first message on the seed of the woman, then we begin to see this idea of a goat being humbled or, or dying we have to put Jesus back into this and realize that, yes, Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth, but he also fulfilled all of the Old Testament sacrifices, which means that he became the sin offering. Right? You with me? Now, out of that sin offering came an opportunity for life. One lot fell on the goat that was slain as a sin offering. The other one was let go. Out of death came life. That's the Old Testament principle there. In the New Testament, this is going to introduce us into this whole idea that out of death can come life. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but remember what Jesus said. He who finds his life shall lose it. He who loses his life for my sake in the gospel shall find it. So remember that as we think about this idea of a goat fish and walk with me because the fish part of this implies life. The goat dies in order to bring about a new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If any man be in Christ... All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become. Do you ever see goats swimming in the sea? No. It's a different world. If you're going to go from goat to fish, you're probably not going to be chewing your cud if you're a fish. Do you get my point? You, you see, I hope you can see that because as I, I can see these people reading the constellations and telling the story in the stars how there's going to be the death of the goat. And I, I really want to camp out on this because what does the goat represent? A stubbornness. What do goats eat? Anything. <laughs> goats, we, we've raised goats. And Goats will always try and push the limits. They, they, seriously, if they can get their head through, they're working on getting their body through. And I, one time we had this one goat, and she kept getting out. Well, I had built this really tall house, and off of the house I had this, this patio where the goats would sit, and it was the cutest thing to see. It was next to the horse shed and I could not figure out how because there was no way that goat could jump well I had another stump that was pretty tall and made steps on that so they could get on the roof well this goat got up on the roof and said I think I can jump over there 
And she did. I could not figure out for the life of me how in the world this goat got out. But that's the mindset of a goat. You give me an opportunity, I'll take it. I'm going to do it my way. The whole idea of Matthew 25 where Jesus separates the goat from the sheep is this, this reality that uh, if it wasn't convenient for them, they weren't going to do it, you know. And that whole idea of humanity and stubbornness and stiff-necked and hard-hearted and, and those kind of things, as cute as those goats may be, they got, they got heart issues. Now, sheep, they can be ignorant, okay? <laughs> we get that. But the reality of what we're seeing here is the death of the goat would ultimately bring life. Not just any life, but the life that's connected to fish. Now, if the fish means life, think about it this way. Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven being like a net. And it gathers fish in, and then they separate the fish. But the picture is that people are kind of like fish. They're gathered in. So here we have in the stars... Thousands of years ago, this story that the, the, the branch, the seed of the woman, who's going to balance the scales, who's going to conquer death, hell, and the grave, who's going to ultimately be victorious over the dragon, over the, uh, uh, the beast, over the, the, the wolf, over all those things, is going to die in order that there might be life. I don't know about you, but that's the beauty of the gospel story. If I lay down my life, I can rise up to be something that I could never be if I hold on to my life. I hope you can see that. And I hope you can see how they would get excited. Matter of fact, what did Jesus tell Peter he was going to do? What did he tell him he was going to become when he first saw him? Fisher of men. So understand that when Abraham and Isaac were out looking at the stars or when David was looking at the stars, they may not have been able to fully capture all that that meant. But I have a feeling that Peter, when Peter saw the constellations, or it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense now. Why? Because I'm not what I used to be. Jesus was glorified. He was not what he used to be. He could walk through doors. He ascended the reality of that transformation. This is such a beautiful picture of the goat dying in order that the fish may live. Throughout history, archaeologists are still finding these little symbols of a fish uh, etched in. I think I've got another, another picture there. There we go. Down at the bottom, uh, the the fish sign has been discovered over and over in Rome and in the Middle East and even in some of the, the communist countries today because it's a, it's a universal symbol for that, uh, that Christian faith. Uh, Jesus connected it. People have carried it on. And there's a whole, uh, there's a word, ichthos, that goes with that. And people have broken that down. And, and it's just a wonderful declaration of who Jesus is. Can you back that up one more? I think I uh, missed, yes. Okay, so note these stars. In the head is the star al uh, which is the kid or the goat. Dinab al is the sacrifice cometh. In the tail... Uh, Dubai, the sacrifice slain, Mayasad, the slaying, Sa'ad al Maskir, in the record of the cutting off. Now, I don't know if those mean anything to you, but they keep telling me that these stars were trying to convey something in the picture. The picture was great. But the story was even greater. And that in this picture of the goat being slain or, or dying, there was going to be a sacrifice. There was going to be uh, a slain sacrifice. It wasn't going to be a living sacrifice. And there was going to be a cutting off. Uh, if you remember, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Do you remember what happened at the temple? The veil tore in half. 
That was done. That part was fulfilled. Sin's curse was, was paid. The debt was paid. The debt was fulfilled. All of those things were done. And that's the whole idea of, of atonement. And uh, so I hope you can see that in, the, in that picture right there. All right. So next and the next. Oh, back up one more. Excuse me. If you can't remember anything else about Capricornus or Getty, remember that last line. Out of death comes life. If your sign is Capricorn, if you were born in that time and Capricorn is that, or if you run into somebody and they say, yeah, my sign's Capricorn. Matter of fact, I saw a couple pictures as I was looking up some stuff. People tattoo that, that constellation on their arms or, or somewhere. And, and if you can recognize that and you see something like that, oh, that's Getty. No, it's Capricorn. Well, do you know the story? You should tell them the story. <laughs> I hope you can tell them. And tell them this, that Capricorn just constantly reminds generation after generation that out of death comes life. Death, where's your sting? It's gone. Why? Because out of death comes life. Paul said it this way, to die is gain, to live is is Christ. So we got to hold on to that. And that's what this constellation can share for us. Now, here's the great part because the constellation by itself is a great message. It's a good story. But the supporting cast, the deacons, the constellations that surround it or that have been put into this category. And you know, when I, when I look at the, the sky charts and these kind of things, I, it makes me wonder sometimes, you know, how did they capture these in this setting somebody must have known some things long ago because these things have been going on for years and years and years and years and years and they've been the same story over and over and over um i want to believe that there's something divine about this somehow god has put it all together and he's kept it for all these thousands of years just so that pastor mike can teach it on Wednesday nights and get all excited and hopefully you get excited too. <laughs> but he's kept that whole thing. So next slide takes us to the constellation and company. So in this constellation, the three sub or the deacons, uh, the smaller constellations are Sagitta, S-A-G-I-T-T-A, which is the arrow and it stands for the arrow of God sent forth. Then there is Aquila. That's the eagle. Notice that it is in a downward position. And again, just like the head of the goat was in a downward position, it was not rising up in victory. Um, this was this is coming down. And then Delphinus, the dolphin, the dead one rising again. Now, as we go through this, you're going to see that the, the story of this particular constellation is really all about Jesus. It's all about this, this detailed account of what ultimately, what we call the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it starts with the goat dying and the fish coming into being. The first supporting constellation, Sajida, I believe I got that right. If you know it correctly, please let me know. But I think that's right. The next slide, please. Sajida. Psalm 64 and verse 7 says, But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Notice it doesn't say arrows. It just says arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. This idea that God has an arrow is confirmed by this particular constellation. This particular dot to dot has been connected with the arrow of God. Now, it's not a lot of stars and it doesn't have a whole bunch, but in the Hebrew language, the word, the, the, the constellation is not called Sajida, it's called Sham, which means destroyer or, if 
find it here. Apologize. Oh, oh I got it on the slide. Got it on the next slide. There, destroying or desolate. Now, so we, we, we got that part, right? The Bible says God shoots an arrow, they're going to be wounded. The Hebrew word for this particular constellation is destroyer or destroying. So it's the arrow of God, and it is going to accomplish something. It's going to bring a wounding. It's going to bring destruction. It's going to bring uh, his will accomplished. Um, as I was looking at this, I, I began to uh, uncover several different things that... Have you ever heard anybody say, sometimes you need to stop and smell the roses? Now, how fast does an arrow fly? Pretty fast. I mean, even if you throw it, it's, it's pretty fast, okay? So, so we're going to take a little bit of a detour here because the arrow of God is going to do something, but there's a journey in which that arrow travels. And, and I, I captured a couple of these things that scientists have captured, NASA has captured, that are around this particular arrow. And what came to my mind was, you know, sometimes we can get so focused on getting to our destination that we miss some of the sights along the way. So here's a couple of the sights that they've uncovered. Uh, up there, they, there's a star cluster that, that if you were to look, if you were to find this constellation, um, uh, the sham, and you were to, to have the technology to see, you would, get, you would find a star cluster. And from, from what has been discovered, this particular scar, star cluster has actually more light, if I've got the facts right, more light than four of our suns. So it, it looks like, oh, that's pretty cool. But if you were to get right in the middle of it, you get, sun, you get French fried. It's bright. Uh, on the right there, this, this is called the Necklace Nebula. And uh, then down at the bottom, uh, M167 Nebula, and then this planetary nebula. Uh, to me, those are just the, the, remember what we said, the work of his fingers. This is what he does in his spare time. <laughs> he does these things and he shoots an arrow and says, by the way, while you're watching the arrow, take a minute and take a look at some of the other stuff that I do. And we're like, what a mighty God we serve. <laughs> God of wonders beyond our galaxy. I mean, this is the kind of stuff, and it's, it's, it's hundreds of light years away. It's, it's just so far from our ability to truly grasp. If it weren't for the fact that we could entertain a God bigger than us, it would be really hard to believe that some of these pictures are real. Matter of fact, I would venture to say that sometimes you look at these and you're like, where did Pastor Mike get that from? Did Caleb make this in art class? You know, did, uh, did Sam put this together somewhere? You know, it, it kind of looks like kids' art, you know? I mean, that kind of stuff. But the truth is, these are things that man cannot create on his own. And we've captured them. So, as we're looking at the arrow of God shooting, there's a world just beyond our comprehension that once again, in the midst of all God's doing, we have to say, what a mighty God we serve. How great is our God? That's how great he is. He does incredible things. And he still knows my name. He knows your problems. He knows your challenges. He knows your successes. He knows all of that. All right. So think about this for just a minute. Isaiah 53, verse 45 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Remember, the goat dying, life coming to the fish, How's it come? The arrow of God. He was pierced. Job chapter 6 and verse 4, Job said, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Remember Jesus on the cross? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? That idea of, of feeling the weight 
of all of that. Psalms 38 and verse 2 says, For your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. And then think about this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now think about that. Jesus took on flesh. That's that centaur. That horse, that man, that dual nature, the goat, the sin offering, was slain. Why? How? By the arrow of God. If we can hold on to some of that, we can begin to see how the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. How they help us understand. And the Psalms 19 says they speak day unto day and night unto night constantly declaring. And folks, that old idea that somehow the man on the island who's never heard about Jesus, I don't know that that's going to happen. Because those stars are talking. And I have a feeling that when you get out on an island and you don't have the pollution of light going on, fake light, you're going to be able to see some things. And I know God knows where they're at. And he can talk to them just like he talked to Abraham. The angel, or the, excuse me, the arrow is flying. And notice, if you will, this next, cons- this next uh, supporting deacon, the, the, the constellation, the Aquila. Now, that picture is actually upside down. But for the purpose of being able to see the constellation and how the stars are and the dot to dot, and that's how they got that, uh, we, we go from there to the next slide, which challenges us with the idea that it's not actually going up, it's actually falling. Now, look real close. Do you see where the arrow would have been earlier? So the idea is the arrow went through the eagle, and now the eagle is falling. How do you know that? Well, notice this. The stars in the head, there's a star in the neck that means the wounding, Altair. Then there's a star in the back that is Tarar red, wounded or torn. Then there's a star in the lower ring, Al-Ker, which means pierce, which the name means piercing. And then there's Al-Okal, or tail, which means wounded in the heel. Now, folks, if you've been coming to church for any amount of time and you've heard the prophecy from Genesis, and you have, how can you not see that the arrow of God has pierced, has wounded, has caused the falling of this eagle? What is this whole constellation talking about? Out of death comes life. The Lord is able to break and heal. It's a wonderful declaration that if I am willing to lay down my life, and my wife the other day, she said, you know, we, we were singing that song, I Lay Me Down. If you don't know what we're talking about, that sounds crazy. <laughs> And I'm sure it sounds crazy to people when they say, oh, just give up. Just let God. Just trust God more than you trust yourself. You've got to surrender. You've got to submit. You've got you to give him everything. It sounds crazy to people. But can I take you back to those four pictures? And that's who we're submitting ourselves to. It's not some president. It's not some political system. It's not some preacher. It's we're committing our lives to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who was wounded, the one who was pierced, and the one who took on flesh and blood, laid down his life so that there could be something brand new come about. I hope you can grab that story, and I hope Cap- Capern- Caper- I want to say Capernaum. <laughs> Help me out again. Capricorn. Capricorn. I hope Capricorn takes on a brand new meaning 
And maybe I'll start using Getty. Let me use Getty. Maybe that won't be such a stumbling block. Getty will become that constellation. And I'm still waiting for somebody to, to walk up to me at Walmart or, or somewhere uh, or, or catch a tattoo with, with some, some Zodiac sign on it and spark a conversation. So you'll pray for me that I don't, I don't get too crazy about this. But, but can you see this? The, the eagle is pierced and it's falling. Remember, the whole thing of, of Getty, the whole thing of Capricorn is out of death can come a newness of life. So that takes us to our last constellation, which is Dala in the Hebrew or Delphinus in the Latin. Interestingly enough, that one down at the bottom, I don't know if that looks like a dolphin to you, but the stars and the other names begin to fill that in to where that top picture is what they were looking at. Now, this is going to be crazy, but it really does, it, it, really, it really makes sense. I hope it makes sense to you. Because what happens is there is a, a sense here that, that the goat is dying and that something brand new is coming to life. The eagle is pierced, is wounded, is falling. It's the arrow of God, which means it's God's perfect plan. It's not an accident. It's not a mistake. This is the story. And if I can go so far as to say the gospel story, that through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have found a brand new life. I'm not what I used to be, thank God. But you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> you just hold on. Wait till we get up to heaven. It's going to be amazing. But the point is, out of death comes life. So the last one in this supporting cast, remember the story of the stars, the talking stars, they're telling the story of a Savior who came from glory, who laid down his life in order to take it up again, who was pierced and afflicted in order that what might happen? He could become a dolphin. No, he couldn't become a dolphin, but the point is, he's not a goat anymore. He's not an eagle anymore. Now, you ready for this? In the Jewish culture, the ocean or the sea was very connected to the underworld because they couldn't see under there. It was dark. People would, fall, you know, drown. People would just sink. Ships would go to nowhere, the abyss. So, Jesus conquers the abyss. Death hell, and the grave. So as the goat dies, fish, totally different. As the eagle is pierced and falls, something totally different rises to the occasion. Some of the other names that were connected with this is Dalaf, which is Arabic, pouring out of water, and, and I think of a pot pouring out of water, but, but think about this. A dolphin is known for jumping. It leaps. I don't know how it does it, but it, it comes out of the water, right? And they do these tricks, and incredible, if you've been to the, any of the shows, uh, it's just an amazing scenario how these, how these dolphins have this ability to go vertical from what is horizontal. You get it? Scalon, coming quickly. Rotov, Rotenev, swift as flowing water. I wrote new, swiftly running. You ready for the next picture? Because this is what I want you to grasp. Out of death, don't show it yet. Out of death comes life. Not just life, but abundant life. 
What does abundant life look for look look like for a dolphin? Oh, just swimming in the water. Oh no 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 no. Take a look at this. That's abundant life. <laughs> They're leaping. They're flying. They're jumping. They are defying the, the, the atmosphere, the environment, the culture. They're not bound by the water. You get it? Ah, oh, I think it's so great. <laughs> because through Jesus, we are more than conquerors. And to me, that's what that says. So that last constellation in that whole thing about out of death comes life is this wonderful conclusion that out of death, my personal death to sin, my past, my personal death to the things of this world, I can not only have life, but there's an abundance of life. And I don't know about you, but that dolphin has a way of bringing smiles to people. It has a way of just encouraging and uplifting. And that's what Jesus does for those who put their trust in him. And that's what he has in store for us. So as we wrap up this constellation, grasp that. Out of death comes life. But it's not just existence. It's that kind of life. Matter of fact, that one at the top right and the two and the three on the bottom, they actually, dolphins can actually walk on water. It's an amazing, I mean, I don't know that they, they tiptoe along, but th whatever they do with their tail, they can, they can go vertical in a horizontal world. I don't know about you, but that's what we need to be in this day. We need to be vertical in a horizontal world. We need to set our eyes on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Isn't that great? <laughs> Gives you a whole brand new appreciation for dolphins. <laughs> and fish. Amen. Comments? Questions? Isn't that great? I, I never saw that. I, I got to tell you. I, I get overwhelmed every Wednesday because there's so much stuff and so many languages I don't know and so much history. But when I, when I tie it in with Jesus, man, it does. It does. So here we are. Next week, we'll be halfway through. And, and we are starting the, the, the next section of this, which is the church age. And it starts with this. Jesus laid down his life in order that something brand new could be born the goat the fish totally different 180 degrees opposite land water but when he brings us back to life he wants us to have abundant life not just swim around in the water walk on water leap over the water play in the just kidding okay i better stop <laughs> all right so last slide here oh yeah, I think I, oh, I think I'm good. Okay, last slide. The arrow of God sent forth, the smitten one falling, the dead one rising again, all in the constellation of Gedi, or Capricorn, the goatfish that says, out of death, the sin offering comes life and I would like to add abundant life because I can't get that picture of a dolphin out of my head <laughs> and that dolphin to me just simply says go vertical in a world that wants to keep you horizontal in a world that wants you to just swim like everybody else is swimming go vertical lift up your eyes to the heavens and let the glory of the Lord fill your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God, once again, I want to thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for the privilege and honor of being able to just hear what, what the stars have been saying for all these years. And I pray, Jesus, that it would become more than just a story. It would become our life. That we would find victory in Jesus. And as we lay our lives down, I pray, Lord, that you would guide us and direct us. 
Give us the strength and courage to be able to share with others this wonderful truth that out of death can come life and abundant life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've got three minutes, I got one more paragraph that this guy, this is some of the guy that really got me going. Uh, he wrote a book, The Witness of the Stars, and he, he does some great detail. If, if you want to borrow it, if you want to get the name of it and, and buy one, it'd be great. Um, but he, he, he had a guy by the name of Joseph Seiss that wrote on the same, same ideas, but he, he concludes this particular constellation this way. He says, This strange goat fish dying in its head, but living in its afterpart, falling as an eagle pierced and wounded by the arrow of death, but springing up from the dark waves with the matchless vigor and beauty of the dolphin, sinking under sin's condemnation, but rising again as sin's conqueror, developing new life out of death and heralding a new springtime out of December's long, drear nights, was framed by no blind chance of man. The story which it tells is the old, old story on which hangs the only availing hope that, can ever, that ever came or ever can come to Adam's race. To what it signifies, we are forever shut up as the only saving faith. In that dying seed of the woman, we must see our sin bearer and the atonement for our guilt, or die ourselves unpardoned and unsanctified. Through his death and blood shedding, we must find our life, or the true life, which alone is life, we never can have. Ah, just a good good way to wrap that up <laughs> so so lord bless you I hope, I hope you're getting half as excited as i am i'm looking forward to the rest of it and and like i said i'm gonna i'm gonna start doing some handouts because i know sometimes it's nice to write down and some of these things i want to i want to provoke you to something good but god bless you thanks for coming